This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. George Bernard Shaw by G. K. Chesterton Section 13 Chapter 6 Part 4 The Philosopher the two important plays that he has since given us are The Doctor's Dilemma and Getting Married. The first is, as regards its most amusing and effective elements, a throwback to his old game of guying the men of science. It was a very good game, and he was an admirable player. The actual story of The Doctor's Dilemma itself seems to me less poignant and important than the things with which Shaw had lately been dealing. First of all, it has been said, Shaw has neither the kind of justice nor the kind of weakness that goes to make a true problem. We cannot feel the doctor's dilemma because we cannot really fancy Bernard Shaw being in a dilemma. His mind is both fond of abruptness and fond of finality. He always makes up his mind when he knows the facts and sometimes before. Moreover, this particular problem, though Shaw is certainly, as we shall see, nearer to pure doubt about it than about anything else, does not strike the critic as being such an exasperating problem after all. An artist of vast power and promise, who is also a scamp of vast profligacy and treachery, has a chance of life, if specially treated, for a special disease. The modern doctors and even the modern dramatists are in doubt whether he should be specially favored because he is aesthetically important or specially disregarded because he is ethically antisocial. They seesaw between the two despicable modern doctrines, one that geniuses should be worshipped like idols and the other that criminals should be merely wiped out like germs, that both clever men and bad men ought to be treated like men does not seem to occur to them. As a matter of fact, in these affairs of life and death, one never does think of such distinctions. Nobody does shout at the sea, bad citizens overboard. I should recommend the doctor in his dilemma to do exactly what I am sure any decent doctor would do without any dilemma at all, to treat the man simply as a man and give him no more and no less favor than he would to anybody else. In short, I'm sure a practical physician would drop all these visionary, unworkable modern dreams about type and criminology and go back to the plain business-like facts of the French Revolution and the rights of man. The other play, Getting Married, is a point in Shaw's career, but only as a play, not as usual as a heresy. It is nothing but a conversation about marriage, and one cannot agree or disagree with the view of marriage because all views are given which are held by anybody and some i should think which are held by nobody but its technical quality is of some importance in the life of its author it is worth consideration as a play because it is not a play at all it marks the culmination and completeness of that victory of bernard shaw over the british public or rather over their official representatives of which I have spoken. Shaw had fought a long fight with businessmen, those incredible people who assured him that it was useless to have wit without murders, and that a good joke, which is the most popular thing everywhere else, was quite unsaleable in the theatrical world. In spite of this, he had conquered by his wit and his good dialogue, and by the time of which we now speak, he was victorious and secure. All his plays were being produced as a matter of course in England, and as a matter of the fiercest fashion and enthusiasm in America and Germany. No one who knows the nature of the man will doubt that under such circumstances his first act would be to produce his wit naked and unashamed. He had been told that he could not support a slight play by mere dialogue. He therefore promptly produced mere dialogue without the slightest play for to support. Getting Married is no more a play than Cicero's dialogue De Amicita, and is not half so much a play as Wilson's Noctes Ambrosiana. But though it is not a play, it was played, and played successfully. 
Everyone who went into the theatre felt that he was only eavesdropping at an accidental conversation. But the conversation was so sparkling and sensible that he went on eavesdropping. This, I think, as it is the final play of Shaw, is also, and fitly, his final triumph. He is a good dramatist, and sometimes even a great dramatist, but the occasions when we get glimpses of him as really a great man are on these occasions when he is utterly undramatic. From first to last, Bernard Shaw has been nothing but a conversationalist. It is not a slur to say so. Socrates was one, and even Christ himself. He differs from that divine and that human prototype in the fact that, like most modern people, he does, to some extent, talk in order to find out what he thinks, whereas they knew it beforehand. But he has the virtues that go with the talkative man, one of which is humility. You will hardly ever find a really proud man talkative. He is afraid of talking too much. Bernard Shaw offered himself to the world with only one great qualification, that he could talk honestly and well. He did not speak. He talked to a crowd. He did not write. He talked to a typewriter. He did not really construct a play. He talked through ten mouths or masks instead of through one. His literary power and progress began in casual conversations, and it seems to me supremely right that it should end in one great and casual conversation. His last play is nothing but garrulous talking, that great thing called gossip. And I'm happy to say that the play has been as efficient and successful as talk and gossip have always been among the children of men. Of his life in these later years, I have made no pretense of telling even the little that there is to tell. Those who regard him as a mere self-advertising egoist may be surprised to hear that there is perhaps no man of whose private life less could be positively said by an outsider. Even those who know him can make little but a conjecture of what has lain behind this splendid stretch of intellectual self-expression. I only make my conjecture like the rest. I think that the first great turning point in Shaw's life, after the early things of which I have spoken, the taint of drink in the teetotaler home, or the first fight with poverty, was the deadly illness which fell upon him at the end of his first flashing career as a Saturday reviewer. I know it would go Shaw to madness to suggest that sickness could have softened him. That is why I suggest it. But I say for his comfort that I think it hardened him also, if that can be called hardening, which is only the strengthening of our souls to meet some dreadful reality. At least it is certain that the larger spiritual ambitions, the desire to find a faith and found a church, come after that time. I also mention it because there is hardly anything else to mention. His life is singularly free from landmarks, while his literature is so oddly full of surprises. His marriage to Miss Payne Townsend, which occurred not long after his illness, was one of those quite successful things which are utterly silent. The placidity of his married life may be sufficiently indicated by saying that, as far as I can make out, the most important events in it were rows about the executive of the Fabian Society. If such ripples do not express a still and lake-like life, I do not know what would. Honestly, the only thing in his later career that can be called an event is the stand made by Shaw at the Fabians against the sudden assault of Mr. H. G. Wells, which, after scenes of splendid exasperations, ended in Wells' resignation. There was another slight ruffling of the calm when Bernard Shaw said some quite sensible things about Sir Henry Irving. But on the whole, we confront the composure of one who has come into his own. The method of his life has remained mostly unchanged, and there is a great deal of method in his life. I can hear some people murmuring something about method in his madness. He is not only neat and businesslike, but, unlike some literary men I know, does not conceal the fact. Having all the talents proper to an author, he delights to prove that he also has all the talents proper to a publisher or even to a publisher's clerk. 
though many looking at his light brown clothes would call him a bohemian he really hates and despises bohemianism in the sense that he hates and despises disorder and uncleanness and irresponsibility all that part of him is peculiarly normal and efficient he gives good advice he always answers letters and answers them in a decisive and very legible hand he has said himself that the only educational art that he thinks important is that of being able to jump off tram cars at the proper moment though a rigid vegetarian he is quite regular and rational in his meals and though he detests sports he takes quite sufficient exercise while he has always made a mock of science in theory he is by nature prone to meddle with it in practice he is fond of photographing and even more fond of being photographed he maintained in one of his moments of mad modernity that photography was a finer thing than portrait painting more exquisite and more imaginative he urged the characteristic argument that none of his own photographs were like each other or like him but he would certainly wash the chemicals off his hands the instant after an experiment just as he would wash the blood off his hands the instant after a socialist massacre he cannot endure stains or accretions he is of that temperament which feels tradition itself to be a coat of dust whose temptation it is to feel nothing but a sort of foul accumulation or living disease even in the creeper upon the cottage or the moss upon the grave so thoroughly are his tastes those of the civilized modern man that if it had not been for the fire in him of justice and anger he might have been the most trim and modern among the millions whom he shocks and his bicycle and brown hat have been no menace in Brixton. But God sent among those suburbans one who was a prophet, as well as a sanitary inspector. He had every qualification for living in a villa, except the necessary indifference to his brethren living in pigsties. But for the small fact that he hates with a sickening hatred the hypocrisy and class cruelty, he would really accept and admire the bathroom and the bicycle and asbestos stove, having no memory of rivers or of roaring fires in these things like mr straker he is the new man but for his great soul he might have accepted modern civilization it was a wonderful escape the man whom men so foolishly call crazy and anarchic has really a dangerous affinity to the fourth-rate perfections of our provincial and protestant civilization he might even have been respectable if he had had less self-respect his fulfilled fame and this tone of repose and reason in his life together with the large circle of his private kindnesses and the regard of his fellow artists should permit us to end the record in a tone of almost patriarchal quiet if i wish to complete such a picture i could add many touches that he has consented to wear evening dress that he has supported the times book club and that his beard has turned gray the last to his regret as he wanted it to remain red till they had completed color photography he can mix with the most conservative statesman his tone grows continuously more gentle in the manner of religion it would be easy to end with the lion lying down with the lamb the wild irishman tamed or taming everybody shall reconcile to the british public as the British public is certainly largely reconciled to Shaw. But as I put these last papers together, having finished this rude study, I hear a piece of news. His latest play, The Showing Up of Blanco Posnet, has been forbidden by the censor. As far as I can discover, it has been forbidden because one of the characters professes a belief in God and states his conviction that God has got him. This is wholesome. This is like one crack of thunder in a clear sky. Not so easily does the prince of this world forgive. Shaw's religious training and instinct is not mine, but in all honest religion there is something that is hateful to the prosperous compromise of our time. You are free in our time to say that God does not exist. You are free to say that he exists and is evil. You are free to say, like poor old Renan, that he would like to exist if he could. You may talk of God as a metaphor or a mystification. 
you may water him down with gallons of long words or boil him to the rags of metaphysics and it is not merely that nobody punishes but nobody protests but if you speak of god as a fact as a thing like a tiger as a reason for changing one's conduct then the modern world will stop you somehow if it can we are long past talking about whether an unbeliever should be punished for being irreverent it is now thought irreverent to be a believer i end where i began it is the old puritan in shaw that jars the modern world like an electric shock that vision with which i meant to end that vision of culture and common sense of red brick and brown flannel of the modern clerk broadened enough to embrace shaw and shaw softened enough to embrace the clerk all that vision of a new london begins to fade and alter the red brick begins to burn red hot and the smoke from all the chimneys has a strange smell i find myself back in the fumes in which i started perhaps i have been misled by small modernities perhaps what i have called fastidiousness is a divine fear perhaps what i have called coldness is a predestinate and ancient endurance the vision of the fabian villa grows fainter and fainter until i see only a void place across which runs bunyan's pilgrim with his fingers in his ears bernard shaw has occupied much of his life in trying to elude his followers the fox has enthusiastic followers and shaw seems to regard his in much the same way this man whom men accuse of bidding for applause seems to me to shrink even from his scent if you agree with shaw he is very likely to contradict you i have contradicted shaw throughout that is why i come at last almost to agree with him his critics have accused him of vulgar self-advertisement in his relation to his followers he seems to me rather marked with a sort of mad modesty he seems to wish to fly from agreement to have as few followers as possible all this reaches back i think to the three roots from which his meditation grew it is partly the mere impatience and irony of the irishman it is partly the thought of the calvinist that the host of god should be thinned rather than thronged that gideon must reject soldiers rather than recruit them and it is partly alas the unhappy progressive trying to be in front of his own religion trying to destroy his own idol and even to desecrate his own tomb but from whatever causes this furious escape from popularity has involved shaw in some perversities and refinements which are almost mere insincerities and which make it necessary to disentangle the good he has done from the evil in this dazzling course i will attempt some summary by stating the three things in which his influence seems to me thoroughly good and the three things in which it seems bad but for the pleasure of ending on a finer note i will speak first of those that seem bad the primary respect in which shaw has been a bad influence is that he has encouraged fastidiousness he has made men dainty about their moral meals this is indeed the root of his whole objection to romance many people have objected to romance for being too airy and exquisite shaw objects to romance for being too rank and coarse many have despised romance because it is unreal shaw really hates it because it is a great deal too real shaw dislikes romance as he dislikes beef and beer raw brandy or raw beefsteaks romance is too masculine for his taste you will find throughout his criticisms amid all their truth the wild justice or pungent impartiality a curious undercurrent of prejudice upon one point the preference for the refined rather than the rude or ugly thus he will dislike a joke because it is coarse without asking if it is really immoral he objects to a man sitting down on his hat whereas the austere moralist should only object to his sitting down on someone else's hat this sensibility is barren because it is universal it is useless to object to a man being made ridiculous man is born ridiculous as can easily be seen if you look at him soon after he is born it is grotesque to drink beer 
but it is equally grotesque to drink soda water. The grotesqueness lies in the act of filling yourself like a bottle through a hole. It is undignified to walk with a drunken stagger, but it is fairly undignified to walk at all. For all walking is a sort of balancing, and there is always in the human being something of a quadruped on its hind legs. I do not say he would be more dignified if he went on all fours. I do not know that he ever is dignified except when he is dead. We shall not be refined till we are refined into dust. Of course it is only because he is not wholly an animal that man sees he is a rum animal. And if a man on his hind legs is in an artificial attitude, it is only because, like a dog, he is begging or saying thank you. Everything important is, in that sense, absurd from the grave baby to the grinning skull. Everything practical is a practical joke. But throughout Shaw's comedies, curiously enough, there is a certain kicking against this great doom of laughter. For instance, it is the first duty of a man who is in love to make a fool of himself. But Shaw's heroes always seem to flinch from this, and attempt in airy philosophic revenge to make a fool of the woman first. The attempts of Valentine and Chartres to divide their perceptions from their desires, and tell the woman she is worthless even while trying to win her, are sometimes almost torturing to watch. It is like seeing a man trying to play a different tune with each hand. I fancy this agony is not only in the spectator, but in the dramatist as well. It is Bernard Shaw struggling with his reluctance to do anything so ridiculous as to make a proposal. For there are two types of great humorist, those who love to see a man absurd, and those who hate to see him absurd. Of the first kind are Rabelais and Dickens, of the second are Swift and Bernard Shaw. So far as Shaw has spread or helped a certain modern reluctance or mauvaise haunt in these grand and grotesque functions of man, I think he has definitely done harm. He has much influence among the young men, but it is not an influence in the direction of keeping them young. One cannot imagine him inspiring any of his followers to write a war song, or drinking song, or love song, the three forms of human utterance which come next in nobility to a prayer. It may seem odd to say that the net effect of a man, so apparently impudent, will be to make men shy, but it is certainly the truth. Shyness is always the sign of a divided soul. A man is shy because he somehow thinks his position at once despicable and important. If he were without humility, he would not care, and if he were without pride, he would not care. Now the main purpose of Shaw's theoretic teaching is to declare that we ought to fulfill these great functions of life, that we ought to eat and drink and love. But the main tendency of his habitual criticism is to suggest that all the sentiments, professions, and postures of these things are not only comic, but even contemptibly comic, follies, and almost frauds. The result would seem to be that a race of young men may arise who do all these things but do them awkwardly. That which was of old a free and hilarious function becomes an important and embarrassing necessity. Let us endure all the pagan pleasures with a Christian patience. Let us eat, drink, and be serious. The second of the two points on which I think Shaw has done definite harm is this, that he has, not always or even as a rule intentionally, increased that anarchy of thought which is always the destruction of thought. Much of his early writing has encouraged among the modern youth that most pestilent of all popular tricks and fallacies, what is called the argument of progress. I mean this kind of thing. Previous ages were often, alas, aristocratic in politics or clericalist in religion, but they were always democratic in philosophy. They appealed to man, not to particular men, and if most men were against an idea, that was so far against it. But nowadays, that most men are against a thing is thought to be in its favor. It is vaguely supposed to show that some day most men will be for it. If a man says that cows are reptiles, or that Bacon wrote Shakespeare, he can always quote the contempt of his contemporaries, as in some mysterious way 
proving the complete conversion of posterity. The objection to this theory scarcely needs any elaborate indication. The final objection to it is that it amounts to this. Say anything, however idiotic, and you are in advance of your age. This kind of stuff must be stopped. The sort of democrat who appeals to the babe unborn must be classed with the sort of aristocrat who appeals to his deceased great-grandfather. Both should be sharply reminded they are appealing to individuals whom they know well to be at a disadvantage in the matter of prompt and witty reply. Now, although Bernard Shaw has survived this simple confusion, he has in his time greatly contributed to it. If there is, for instance, one thing that is really rare in Shaw, it is hesitation. He makes up his mind quicker than a calculating boy or a country magistrate. Yet on this subject of the next change in ethics, he has felt hesitation, and being a strictly honest man, has expressed it. Quote, I know no harder practical question than how much selfishness one ought to stand from a gifted person for the sake of his gifts or on the chance of his being right in the long run. The superman will certainly come like a thief in the night and be shot at accordingly, but we cannot leave our property wholly undefended on that account. On the other hand, we cannot ask the superman simply to add a higher set of virtues to current respectable morals, for he is undoubtedly going to empty a good deal of respectable morality out like so much dirty water and replace it by new and strange customs shedding old obligations and accepting new and heavier ones. Every step of his progress must horrify conventional people, and if it were possible for even the most superior man to march ahead all the time, every pioneer of the march towards the superman would be crucified. End, quote. End of section 13, end of chapter 6, part 4.